Hi, I am Niharika Nanda and you are listening to 3 Things, the Indian Express news show. According to a study published by The Lancet last week, India could be facing an obesity epidemic with alarm bells ringing particularly for the young. According to its global analysis, 2.5 million children in the country aged between 5 and 19 were grossly overweight in 2022, up from 0.5 million in 1990. This finding is significant at a time when India already has a high burden of non-communicable diseases including diabetes, strokes and heart disease. The study also comes at a time when the prevalence of undernutrition has remained high in the country and people have increased access to processed food high in fats, salt and sugar. So in this episode we are taking a break from our usual programming and bringing you a conversation about heart diseases that took place between Indian Express's national health editor Colin Sharif and Dr. Ambuj Roy, professor of cardiology at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. In this conversation he explains the factors that cause health problems and what can we do to prevent them. But before the conversation began Dr. Roy provided some context. So just to give you a perspective you know many a time heart disease are not easily diagnosed people don't understand what the common symptoms are. So when we say heart disease here we'll be specifically talking about what is called coronary artery disease or heart diseases caused due to blockages in the blood supply to the heart. He says that these could present themselves in two broad ways. One is a chronic insidious onset chest discomfort. Now this discomfort could be of many different types some could perceive it as pain some perceive it as a crushing feeling some perceive it as uh, what they call in india very commonly gas or dyspepsia burning sensation so it's not typically a pain which happens when you break a bone but it's a very different discomfort that can happen usually when you have pain due to blockages in your arteries what we medically call angina but more importantly this could happen you know as a sudden acute chest discomfort and then this can occur at rest it could occur in the middle of the night it could occur uh, you know when you're exercising or when you're resting and if this kind of discomfort develops typically it is uh, in the middle of your chest it can go radiate to your neck it could go down to your left arm or it could go into the upper part of your tummy so in that case that is what is often signs of an heart attack he says these are symptoms that you should be careful about and you should go to a medical facility immediately if you happen to experience them because you know during an acute heart attack what we call is time is muscle and a lot of uh, damage can happen to the heart including loss of lives which happened during the first hour of the heart attack so you need to get to a facility if you're having one of these uh, symptoms quickly unfortunately in india this is from our survey done in ballabgarh and district of faridabad only about 10% of the people are able to reach appropriate health facility within the golden hour and 45% of the deaths because of heart attack or brain attack happen at home you know before people can understand what's happening they ignore their symptoms and are obviously not able to get any kind of medical attention now dr roy says that we as indians are also vulnerable to heart diseases Studies have shown that as compared to Caucasian population in these western countries we have 50 to 100% higher chances of developing heart diseases. So what brings this on? Obviously some of it is nature that is the genes that we have inherited but lot of it is because of the way we nurture the way we develop what are called risk factors for heart disease. Like typically our diets are pretty low in fresh fruits and vegetables which is one of the very important components of diets which have been shown to be definitely protective against heart attacks so consuming a good amount of fresh fruits and vegetables not the vegetables that we kind of cook and overcook and kill all the nutrients but having them fresh or uh, just sorted will be very useful for prevention of heart diseases low physical activity a stressful life you know having central obesity when we say central obesity you know you see people are generally lean and thin but they develop a large waist a bulge over their tummy 
And that's the worst kind of obesity that you can have, that your waist circumference or your fat around the waist directly correlates with your risk for diabetes, hypertension and heart disease. And this, of course, besides risk factors like high blood pressure, diabetes, tobacco use, high cholesterol and even air pollution. In fact, this is one of the most potent risk factors because, you know, everybody is exposed to this. So it acts as a large risk factor because everybody is exposed to air pollution and it is a trigger for heart diseases. So you can just look at the numbers when we look at India. We have 31 crore people living with high blood pressure and just one in five in urban areas and one in 10 in rural areas have their blood pressure under control. So there's a large burden of untreated high blood pressure, which is responsible for many, many of the heart attacks and the brain attacks that are happening. There are over 23 crore people estimated to be living with high blood sugar, a very potent risk factor of heart disease, increases your chance for heart disease by two to three times if you don't control your blood pressure. Over 35 crore people with living with central obesity and similarly more than 20 crore living with high lipid. So you can understand where the burden or the burgeoning risk for heart disease or the number of heart diseases are coming from because we are not treating these risk screening and not treating these risk factors adequately. But besides keeping these warnings in mind, what can we do to have a good heart? Dr. Roy says that these are the 10 commandments that we can follow. You should say absolutely no to tobacco, good regular physical activity, trying to target eight to 10,000 steps in a day was very good. But anything above 2,500 steps in a day gives you benefits of physical activity. And the more you do it and the closer you reach to the eight to 10,000 target, the better it is and the more protection you have from physical activity. Try to maintain an ideal body weight, but if you're not able to do that, still be physically active. It's been clearly shown that even if you have obesity, if you're physically activity active, then you get a lot of benefits in terms of cardiovascular protection. Eat healthy, as I said. Try to, you know, current day, and it's impossible to say don't stress, but we have to develop resilience to stress. Get your blood pressure regularly checked can target a blood pressure lower than 130-80. Keep your sugar under control. Your three-month average sugar should be less than 6-7%. That's a test called HbA1c. Keep your cholesterol under check. People with heart diseases, once you've developed a blockage and you've been diagnosed with a heart attack or a stent or a bypass surgery, aspirin and statins are mandatory for life because it's been clearly shown to benefit in terms of reducing re-heart attacks. Now, here's Dr. Roy's conversation with Indian Express's Conan Sheriff. So, the heart diseases are most commonly, you know, triggered by blockages. So, so so why does blockages happen? You know, for a layman, if there are five things, you know, that trigger blockages, for someone who does not understand how a heart functions, why does heart blockages happen? So, yeah, this is a very pertinent question. So, you know, when we are born, as I showed you that nice, clean artery, that's how we are born with. But over time, there is a deposition of a kind of a fat, a greasy layer of what is called a plaque in the arteries. It is, of course, related to your age, but some people may have it prematurely. And it's driven by the risk factors that I told you. Like, for example, in the young, the most important risk factor is smoking. So if you do smoke, even if your arteries do not have those layers of fat, what happens? Smoking makes you prone to developing clots or what we call thrombosis. So your clots could form within the artery and give you a heart attack. Then if you have the other risk factors like diabetes, if you have high cholesterol, if you have high blood pressure, then that smooth, nice layer of the artery gets gradually uh, denuded and fat starts depositing there. And these are the early uh, plaques that can happen. And unfortunately, you know, uh, we can visualize some of them, uh, not in the heart, but in your neck vessels using a very simple ultrasound. And unfortunately, they can start very early, even in adolescence. Some of the children have been shown to develop that. If they are obese, then they're not having the right diet. So it really starts very early. It's not when you have that heart attack. It's actually a culmination of years of uh, the pathology that has developed or the risks that you have developed. 
So we don't need to start protection at that 30 or 40 years of age. We need to be teaching our children that they should have these right uh, lifestyles so that they don't develop that. It's not a, a disease that develops in one day. It is a progressive, gradually uh, developing disease. And we need to start very early if we want to really prevent this, um, I would say, the epidemic of heart diseases that we are currently seeing. So you mentioned that this happens over a period of time, which I'm assuming that most of the symptoms are silent, not known. So the most common question or the things that people commonly ask is, or give examples is of young people dying, but he didn't have any symptoms. So how do we find early symptoms? What are the early symptoms, most common early symptoms? And how do you find them? How does a common man able to know this is the symptom for heart attacks? So, friends, unfortunately, as I told you, most of the heart attacks, uh, almost 50%, happen on a very minor blockage. You tend to get symptoms only when the artery I showed you is blocked by a more than 70%. That's the time when there is a limitation of blood supply on exercise, and that leads to symptoms. You know, our arteries are made such that till the 70% blockage does not occur, you will not uh, develop symptoms, which is the chest pain or the angina that I told you. So unfortunately, you will not get symptoms till you develop that scale of blockage. So most of the people would not have symptoms, especially in the young, when they have a heart attack, because the minor blockage that is there leads to a rupture and a clot formation. So the best that you can do is control your risk factors. And it's a bit of maths, you know. What happens is your risk factors accumulate. The more the risk factors, the higher Mm -hmm. chance that you have of having a heart disease. So if Mm -hmm. you have one risk factor, like a family history, you can't reverse that. But what you can do is control your other risk factors more strictly. A related question, you know, we have studies now showing that women have a slightly different symptoms than men. So can you just make us understand what is it? I mean, how is it different? Yeah, so, you know, classically, uh, if you see most of science and medical science, unfortunately had very little participation of women in the studies. So heart attack studies, typically, if you go back in 80s, 90s, when we started research on this, 80, 90% of the patients would be men. So all the science symptoms have come from there, from those kind of studies. So women have been underrepresented and their symptoms do tend to be different. They would not typically present with so much of chest discomfort. They may often present with more of breathlessness. Mm. Uh, they can present with shortness of breath. They can present with a little atypical symptoms like they may have just a lot of sweating during a heart attack or the mm. pain discomfort could be more in the abdomen, upper abdomen. So yes, uh, in women, you need to be a little more careful. They may not have those typical symptoms. So if uh, any acute new onset symptoms in the discomfort or the breathlessness is happening in women, you need to be more careful and uh, treat them uh, or diagnose them with an ECG. Typically, we've seen that women get uh, lower therapies for heart attacks because they're often misdiagnosed or remain undiagnosed for heart attacks. Yeah. You just mentioned that what is under our control is basically, you know, prevention. So let me go back to the, the central focus of prevention, which is, according to me, is nutrition. We have very high intake of uh, carbohydrates which could trigger insulin resistance. So if one has to imagine an ideal plate, what is the proportion that we need to have, whether it's your protein, your carbohydrates, good fat, and of course, multivitamins, which is also very crucial. So again, a very, very, very pertinent question. And, you know, typically our diets are rich in carbs, not rich in fats. And it's not the fats which drives, uh, I think, the coronary artery disease. But fats in the sense of lot of saturated or fats which drives the coronary artery disease epidemic in the West. Our drivers are probably very rich uh, carbs. In fact, our fat contents are on the lower side, if you see. Okay. So, yes. So, I think what drives uh, coronary artery disease in India is very low intake of fresh fruits and vegetables. Although we call ourselves vegetarians, you know, if you look at a typical vegetarian, uh, if you ask, uh, and I have experienced this through my clinics, When you ask the most commonly used vegetable, they say potato. Potato doesn't qualify to be a vegetable. It's it's rich in carbs and it's a tuber. So you need to have color on your plate. If I can put it very simply, the more colorful your plate, 
in terms of having greens, in terms of having a good amount of fruits as your starters or your dessert. Then when you come to carbs, you should concentrate more on millets. Thankfully, you know, with the stress on millet here and all that, it's come back into focus. And so I would say use complex carbohydrates, avoid white rice as you know, or minimize moderate white rice use. Uh, if you see typically south in, of India diet is, or even east uh, or I would say even most of the India is very rich in uh, white uh, rice, you know, polished rice. So we need to go more towards uh, complex carbohydrates, fats. You need to avoid oils that kind of solidify. So that has to be avoided. You can have good fats, which is called MUFA, which is present in nuts, which is actually helps you increase your good cholesterol and uh, concentrate on lentils. Lentils are again very beneficial because they give you a lot of anti-inflammatory substances. So has any of your preliminary studies shown a percentage like 50% should be your greens and maybe 20%, 25% should be proteins and remaining is good fat and carbs, something of that sort? Yeah. So typically your carbs should be about 40 to 50%. Your fats could be 25 to 30% and proteins could be the rest 15, 20, 20%. And your greens, fresh fruits and vegetables should be ideally 400 grams in a day and but surely not less than 300 grams so you should be in that range yeah so a follow-up question because you use the word uh, inflammation so i want to go back to the concept of oxidative stress you know that the body uh, whether it's pollution whether you know the other triggers that you speak about and how one of the ways to reduce it is diet so can you just again focus on why diet oxidative stress and inflammation all of us interconnected although we don't really talk about these things why is it so important to know inflammation the importance of inflammation and oxidative stress so most of the triggers are inflammation you know when you develop uh, for example, a flu or a COVID, what it does is there's a general inflammation in the body. And that's a trigger for a heart attack. It's clearly been shown that flu in the week that you develop flu, the week following that, there is a six time higher chance of having a heart attack as compared to normal times. Mm. So any inflammation is a trigger for heart attack. And clearly, increasingly, we have to know that the coronary artery disease, because of what we call medically atherosclerosis, that is the process of deposition of these uh, gruel in your arteries, is triggered by inflammation. Like pollution, as you rightly said, it can lead to a lot of inflammation, especially high PM 2.5. It gets absorbed into your body, it circulates, gives you inflammation because the body tends to fight that. So those are clear triggers for heart attack. And there is some data that, you know, by increasing in anti-inflammatory foods, which primarily mean lots of fruits and vegetables. And one other important thing uh, that I didn't add in my diet was herbs. Herbs, the more you use, they're very, very potent anti-inflammatory things, whether it's garlic, whether it's the hing, which we use, whether it's the basil that we use or the curry leaves that we use. These are all very well-proven anti-inflammatory agents that you can add to your diet and probably probably reduce uh, the downfalls, at least to some extent, of pollution, which is clear inflammatory trigger. Now, I want to discuss about something that you are closely monitoring, you know, high blood pressure and also elevated levels of cholesterol, two important factors in India which increase the risk of cardiovascular diseases. Could you explain why are we seeing such a high incidence of hypertension in India and as well as increase in levels of cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, of course? So hypertension is very much, uh, I think, uh, related to our uh, lifestyles in many ways. Some of it, as I said, is some of it is nature, but a lot of it is in nurture because uh, it is closely related to your salt intake or lack of, uh, again, diet containing low potassium, which is because you're not having enough fruits and vegetables, which is a or real clear good source of potassium. So when you have an imbalance of that, when you take a lot of uh, you know, these snacks, which are very loaded with uh, salt or you take achar, papar, those kind of things which are very loaded with sodium. Then you, if you're not physically active, if you have obesity around your waist, these are all factors that lead to high blood pressure. But the unfortunate thing is, uh, again, as you know, hypertension is called a silent killer. It would not in the large, large majority of people give you any symptoms. And the first symptom could be a, a complication in terms of a heart attack, brain attack, or a kidney dysfunction. So everybody after the age of 25 
should get their blood pressure measured once definitely and depending on the level you need to be more frequently monitoring it or once in a year and uh, clearly that is something that needs to be treated as for the cholesterol uh, cholesterol is again determined by we typically have what are high triglycerides and this mm-hmm. is clearly related to two important thing or three more important things the large amount of carbs in your diet mm-hmm. two is having central obesity and third is lack of physical activity a lot of it is contributed by these three factors and if we can control that we can clearly bring down uh, the triglyceride levels which are very high and the good cholesterol levels these are the two typical what are called indian dyslipidemia or indian way of having bad lipids can be brought down by these three things yeah so just again i want to go back to nutrition when we are speaking about cholesterol because there is a lot of information misinformation about the fact that cholesterol is a big risk but it's the bad cholesterol and like you said it's mostly carbohydrates that are actually converting into fats you know because of the various factors like insulin resistance and all of that so how important is it to focus on good cholesterol because there's hardly any discussion on that and what do you mean by good cholesterol because replacing them with bad cholesterol is essential so typically when we do a cholesterol test or what is called a lipid profile broadly we get three reports if you look at it carefully it's one is of course the total cholesterol the but the three sub components that you should focus on are one is called the ldl cholesterol which is the bad cholesterol which yeah. is directly related to your probability of have increased risk of heart disease then there is what is called hdl cholesterol which is the good cholesterol which is gives you cardio protection the higher the better and then there's a triglycerides which i spoke about which is largely determined by lifestyle but hdl again is because of low physical activity but we typically have indians have low hdl cholesterol as compared to caucasians and our ldl cholesterols are not so high but uh, they can be on the, in the moderate range ldl cholesterol typically cannot be changed much with a diet yes you can reduce it with good diet physical activity about 15 20% but there's a large component of your genes which determines your um, ldl cholesterol but triglyceride can be influenced largely by lifestyle and fortunately our ldl or the bad ldl cholesterol levels are not so high as in the westerners but the triglycerides and low hdl which are driving our coronary artery disease and those can be improved with better lifestyle my next question you know is people who already suffered from heart attacks the most common question from that cohort is the fact that can you reverse heart disease your there was this 1990 heart tra- lifestyle heart trial which said you could actually reverse heart disease with uh, lifestyle changes very comprehensive ones so what does indian data tell you you know can you really reverse a heart disease so it's a complicated uh, question i mean it really depends on how bad the heart disease you have at current stage unfortunately suppose you have had a heart attack you have not got the proper treatment at the correct time it may lead to a severe damage of your heart the heart is a pump as you understand it pumps every some two times at least uh, on an average in a minute so it's like a pump and it drives the whole body's circulation but if you have a heart attack that pump gets damaged and it can only work to a certain capacity so in those cases reversing it is not possible but getting good adequate uh, what we call secondary prevention there are medicines that you can give which can reduce further worsening and new heart attacks so in milder cases we have a milder heart attack and you've not yet got a damage of your heart attack yes good lifestyle intervention and and as as importantly i would say getting the right three four medicines can not only stall but reverse your heart disease to a large extent now i want to move on to the most discussed topic around heart is covid-19 you said this there is now data that shows that covid-19 increases the risk of heart disease one of the theories that there is intense inflammation that is caused during covid the infection in severe diseases does the virus itself affect the blood vessels directly you know that's my first question and a follow up is of course you know how should we then prevent this yeah so not so much the virus itself virus in some cases have been shown to get in, in fact the heart muscles and can give you some damage to the heart vessels but that's the very small percentage of all the complications of covid most of it as we discussed is because of the inflammation 
And this is nothing new, you know. If we go back in history and look at all, whether it be uh, the Spanish flu, which happened the previous pandemic in the last century, and subsequent flus. And there's a very nice study done in uh, 65 cities of U.S. And if you look at that data, you'll clearly see that every time they have a flu epidemic or a pandemic, there is increased mortality. And 50% of that mortality is not coming directly from the flu, but from other diseases like heart diseases, like stroke attack, brain attacks. So this is not something which we, this is unique to COVID. This has been seen after most flu epidemics. So the information that happens after these uh, viral attacks leads to these complications of heart attack. And what can you do? Well, well, you know, practically everybody has had COVID. Some of them may have had serious uh, COVID when you need hospitalization or ICU care, and they are the most uh, susceptible. So you can't obviously reverse that. You had COVID, you had COVID. But as I said, what you can do is you can work on risk factors, uh, the other risk factors for heart diseases. So as I said, it, you know, the, the risk for heart disease is a cumulative effect of multiple risk factors. So if you can't control one, you need to work harder on the other risk factors. And what's your view on uh, seasonal flu shots and the COVID boosters? How much protection do they provide? Yes. So there is data now, very clear data to show that people who have had heart attacks, when they take that flu shot, the chance of a reattack is reduced by as much as 42% in them. So clearly, people who are at high risk for heart attacks are prevented by these flu shots. One aspect, sir, that's really not discussed, you know, is about the health, heart health is the lack of sleep and the importance of having good sleep. Could you explain the importance of sleep and heart health, you know? So I think uh, it cannot be overstated. Good sleep is absolutely mandatory for your body to recover, right? And uh, I think this is a little anecdotal, but uh, and uh, I can't back it with a lot of data from India. But we've seen a lot of young heart attacks happening in people who do these uh, typically shifts at night, where they or, or what we call call centers, where they do the nights. Uh, because of you know the time zone differences when they're working uh, in these centers, and I have anecdotally seen a lot of young people f- from this setup to have heart attacks. So you obviously sleep and good sleep and maintaining that sleep cycle is important. So if people are employed in such uh, professions, you obviously need to cannot quit, but you need to be again, as I said, a little more careful in managing your risk factors and managing good sleep at other times. You know. So I think sleep is very important for health in general and cardiovascular disease in particular. And you were just talking about anecdotal evidence, but if we have to just look at your OPD, you know, in the last two, three years, what are the trends that you are seeing in heart attacks or heart health, whether it's among the young women, you know, that, that's worrying you. The three things maybe we don't notice, but you are noticing in your OPD. I would say, you know, unfortunately, we're seeing the disease happening in younger people. And as cardiologist, I'm seeing The anatomy, you know, when we do an angiogram, very diffuse disease, typically which you would see in the 60s and 70s, as it was reported from Western countries, that kind of disease we're seeing in 30s and 40s. So very malignant kind of uh, atherosclerosis that we're seeing in our setups. And unfortunately, you know, large number of women also are coming with heart diseases. And uh, what we're seeing is clearly the presentation for heart disease is almost a decade younger in our uh, countrymen as compared to what is reported from the West. And the other thing which is not so much spoken about is tobacco chewing. It's a clear risk factor which is not very well written uh, in the Western literature and, and we're seeing that really predisposes to heart disease. Now coming to the other aspect, you know, everyone talks about prevention and we have this whole thing of annual tests and full body checkups. There was an interesting question asked by one of our readers right now, is ECG a good enough test to detect heart blockages? So two things, what are the essential preventive tests that we have to do and how often do you have to do and at what age does this have to start? Yeah, so I would say starting from your last question is age. I think everybody should get that one basic test done beyond 25 years of age. And I think as a general measure, there are some very basic tests that you need to do. As I say, keep it simple. You just need to measure your blood pressure. You just need to get your blood sugar and blood cholesterol done. 
And, you know, you need an assessment of your lifestyle. You need a good advice on your lifestyle because not everybody understands what the right lifestyle measures are. So I don't believe in these words of full body checkup and executive checkups. Uh, you know, that really confuses people. What is a full body checkup? I mean, I don't understand that term. So I would say for as a mass advice to a large population, just keep these three things. You get your blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol, get the right advice on tobacco and diet and a good physical activity. So if you do that, you would have covered a large number of people. But yes, if your physician feels that you have certain symptoms, which may be a symptoms of early heart disease, then at that level, you need to do the second level of cardiac testing, which could be a stress test, which could be a TMT. But TMT exercise, CG, as I see, use as a this quote-unquote executive checkup in everybody causes more harm than any benefit. Because, you know, it's a very nuanced thing, but you need to understand when you start applying that test to everybody in sitting in that room, there will be more false positives leading to, you know, unnecessary downward Uh, more testing and unnecessary interventions in the population. So you need to apply that test to the right subset of people so that you can use the test optimally. If you start applying it to everybody, then there's more harm than that. Sir, then a very, very important question is genetics, India and genetics. The question is, what if genetics are prone to heart diseases and how can that be reversed? Obviously, you can't (laughs) reverse your genetics, right? Um, You've been born with it. But it's not that all is lost. So suppose there has been an unfortunate event in your family and so you've lost somebody young, then you need to be doubly be careful. It's not that all is lost. You just need to be sure that your blood cholesterol levels are even lower than what would be recommended for other people. Your blood pressure control, your blood sugar control should be more strict. You should absolutely refrain from tobacco, alcohol. And you should have a good diet. So what I'm trying to say uh, repeatedly and trying to tell you that it's a bit of a maths here, right? So it is one plus two minus one plus two minus. So if you have a couple of minuses, you work on the other pluses that you can get into your system. So you be more careful about your lifestyle. You be more careful about your cholesterol, sugar and blood pressure levels so that you can negate the negatives that you have like bad genes. So that can be easily be done. So if you kind of work on the other risk factors, you can reduce your chance of having a heart disease. Another question, you know, a pertinent question because a lot of women are facing issues related to OVD. The question is that one of a reader's wife is suffering from high blood pressure and also has her ovary removed. She's working. What's the right guidance for patients like this? Well, one is you need to get your blood pressure under control. There are enough medicines that can help you control your blood pressure. And you might make sure that you you get that under check. That can be done easily with you know, so many medicines available. And uh, sometimes in young, you may be advised hormone replacement therapies. But that's a very specific uh, ailment to answer here. But sometimes that can help and you need to get that advice from your doctor. But and it may not be that just because the OVs are removed that you are hypertensive. If you look at the population, and this is from a survey in Delhi, 30% of people in 30s and 40% in 40s had hypertension. So maybe that's a contributing factor, but that may not be the only reason. Uh, hypertension is extremely common. It's, uh, it's just that people are not aware because they don't measure So I'll take a last question from our reader, you know, something you made a passing reference about millets. We are celebrating the International Year of Millets. There's a lot of focus about how you should introduce that in your diet. Can you just sort of make us understand why are we doing this, especially keeping in mind the Indian diets and what are those alternatives that we need to introduce now? So millets are generally complex carbohydrates and they have a lot of good nutrients in terms of minerals and other positive diet ingredients. And they lower your inflammation that we've been speaking about. So that way, it's good. Its absorption is slow. So it doesn't peak the sugar levels that would happen after, say, polished rice diet. So those are the good things about it. It is absorption. It is slow. It's it's a nutrient. It has rich in uh, nutrient value. 
So that's why it is an excellent, and, and it's a time-known uh, superfood. It's just that we're trying to rediscover it. If you could probably ask your grandmother, and they would be taking this. It's just that we're now rediscovering and you know going back the whole cycle. But it's it's a very good food in terms of uh, prevention of inflammation and heart disease. You were listening to Three Things by the Indian Express. Today's show was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar and produced by Shashank Bhargav and me, Niharika Nanda. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Audio and write to us at podcasts at IndianExpress.com. 